All right, everybody, how you doing? It's Tuesday, um, and I hope you're out there planning on some tacos tonight, at the very least, um, because tacos is that menu item that I think everybody can tackle. Um, I could be wrong. There just could be people out there who can't put a taco together. But we have a great program today. Joining us is Kristen uh, O'Connor from Capers Catering, um, which is a catering company based out of Boston. Um, and let's bring her on. Hey, Kristen, how you doing? Hi, Trish. I'm good. How are you? I am here. I, you know, we, we were just talking about um, how that I'm not, it's not that I'm a bad cook, it's that I'm a lazy cook. <laughs> um, I feel like tacos are something that I could do. Yes. Tacos are, it is Taco Tuesday. I think I need to shift my idea for the menu tonight. No leftovers and just make tacos. I think tacos are yeah. something everybody can do because there's no science to it. Just throw a bunch of stuff in a taco shell. Just, right, just slap it all together. But, um, well, you know, let's let's get the formalities out of the way. Let everybody know, like, who you are, where you are, and what you do. Yeah, so my name is Kristen O'Connor. Um, it will be Atwood soon. I got married five months ago, and I have not changed my last name yet. Congratulations. Um, thank you. But now I, you know, social security offices are closed and all that. So that's oh, my career. Yeah, yeah. Um, it will happen eventually, but I am in Boston, Mass., um, I am the director of catering sales for a boutique, high-end, full-service catering company up here in Boston, and we serve all of New England. I am also the current president of NACE Boston, uh, NACE is National Association of Catering and Event Professionals, and we have a nice large chapter up here in Boston, so I am their fearless leader. Uh, you know, and that, that was... Um you know, that was, that's busy enough. That's, you know, it's like you, um, you know, you got married and you're director of catering and you're president of, uh, you know, a, you know, a fairly large chapter of a national association. Um, you know, you're doing all these things and now this. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, even, I mean, at first it was a screeching halt. Um, but now it's sort of a, you know, what we do daily anyways. It's figuring out how to pivot. It's problem solving. It's figuring out creative, unique ways to do things and do things differently. So we are still um, surviving. We may not be thriving as much as we used to be, but we're figuring out really unique, creative ways to kind of stay afloat, keep things going, keep NACE Boston members um, happy and engaged and also, you know, stay afloat as a catering company. We had our best year ever the past few years, and now it's not going to be a good year. 2020 is going to be a pretty bad year uh, financially, but we've pivoted. We've figured out creative things to do, which we can talk about, and uh, we're going to we're gonna stay strong. We're going to be back. Um, yeah, tell me about that, because, you know, there are, there are, you know, lots of caterers who are, you know, who watch, you know, not only this programming, but who are out there, um, you know, we were, um, we, you know, just pre-call, uh, we were talking about cater source. I ran into someone who owns a catering company out here locally. And she was telling me that at that point she had laid off half her staff. Um, you know, like what's, what's up with cater with capers? Like, how did you guys, was it, was it staggered? Was it, um, wait and see, like, how did you guys manage it from the beginning until now? It was staggered for sure. We have a wonderful owner. Um, her name is Emma Roberts. So kudos to women owned business. And she had to make some really tough decisions. Um, she's, you know, we saw this happening. It was like a domino effect. We had, you know, someone would call one day and they would say, we're canceling our event and it's in March. And then two more people would call the next day and say, we're canceling our, our event it's the following week in March. And then we got the April calls, then we got the May calls, and it was like literally dominoes, but like your heart just sank every time somebody called and either canceled their event or postponed. Um, we can talk about that too and sort of the differences, but she saw this and and again, like we're, we're still considered a small business. We had five salespeople and now we have two. Um, we had an event team of a hundred people and now we have zero. We staggered the layoffs a little bit. We are hoping okay. to bring everybody back as soon as we can. 
Um, but right now we're just a core group of like four or five people just pivoting to do delivery work actually. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, um, that's a avenue that a lot of catering companies have pursued at this point in time. Um, it's yeah. like pivoting to the, to the whole delivery model. Yeah. Um, and, and have you, um, have you come up with like a special delivery menu or did you open up like your whole menu and then people just kind of like say, Hey, uh, you know, I really love, you know, your, your, your the beef with, uh, you know, the, the balsamic reduction, you know, but can you do that for four people? Right. And you're like, yeah, I guess we could do it for four people. You know, yeah. how, how did that work out for you? There are challenges for sure. Um, again, fortunately, we have a really awesome executive chef who immediately said, let's pivot, let's do delivery. Okay. Um, so that was something that we decided sort of right away. He came up with all of the menus um, and what we did, at, and they actually just changed today for the future, but okay. um, what we did for the past month and a half or so, um, he wrote down five different menu options. And originally we, you know, we, we are a full service caterer. We do not do delivery work. We pride ourselves in having full staff at every one of our events and make, maintaining that really high level of service. So this was something that was very new for us. Um, we did some trial and error. We did, okay, yeah. this is eight to 10 people, right? Eight to 10 servings. And then the CDC kept coming out and saying those gatherings had to be lower and lower until it became quarantine. So yeah. stay at home. And we're kind of like, all right, we can't be doing this for eight to 10 people because you can't even see anybody. So we lowered our, our packages. We streamlined them to what our chef could get, right? So a lot of the purveyors have limited hours, limited deliveries. Um, we're, we're very much a fully customizable catering service. So it's not like you walk in and we have all of this product. We buy product based on the menus that we're doing for the events we're doing. So right. our chef made it very streamlined and easy where it's still that really high quality food. Um, but the menu options, I think they're amazing. There's a lot of options, but they are more limited than our normal menus. And when I say normal menus, it's anything you can think of in the world. Um, so, so that's sort of how we've been doing the delivery process. And then we've been doing a weekly special every week to kind of get people hyped up. Uh, excited about something, we release it on Friday, and that's sort of a slightly discounted price, and it can also be for less people. Uh, so that's sort of been keeping us alive, and we've had really great success with it, which is awesome. Um, oh, I mean, I, I mean, anything that you can do, I think, at this point in time, to um, you know, even if you're even if you're only making just enough profit to pay the rent and keep the bills paid. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and you're you're cutting out that profit mar margin entirely by what you're doing. Yep. Um, then it's something. Um, it also keeps you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It keeps it keeps people like sort of you know aware of your catering company um, and and things that you're doing. Um, and now have you there? There, I've also seen where catering companies have gotten involved with sort of food pantries and different things like that. Um, have you you know has has capers gone that route just yet or, or are you still kind of focused on the delivery part of the, the business we have we've been aware so there's a few programs up here in boston that we've signed up for so one is called off their plate that a few celebrity chefs in boston and other chefs have been contributing to so you make bulk meals for hospital workers um that's kind of one thing that we've signed up for we haven't done it yet we signed up last week um Another thing is we've had uh, people buy meals for healthcare workers. So last week nice. we did a big delivery to a floor of nurse, nurses at Mass General Hospital. And what happened was this company sponsored the meals and then we made them and delivered them. So it was like they were helping us as a small business and they were also helping these nurses who are working crazy hours at one of the busiest hospitals in Boston get a free meal, get some chocolate brownie pops, get some candied bacon and just kind of make that. them smile. So we've definitely yeah. been pushing that more. Um, and some of our marketing techniques are going to be even more changed coming up just because now we're even more used to the delivery system that we're doing. Yeah. I, I, well, and it's one of those things where, you know, as people have been, you know, required to pivot in their businesses, they, you know, like it, it's not sort of like a soft pivot, right? There's like, there, there's no, 
um, like, hey, I think this would be a really great addition to our business. And we're going to like roll it out over the course of three months. And you know, before we do an official launch, and then we'll do a launch party, because that's what we do um, yeah. in this industry. No, it was like, okay, it's Monday, we need to be up and ready by like, 5 p.m. tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah, so, and we did it. And you did it. I mean, was there what, what was there a steep learning curve? Like, like what were the um, you know, if like if you were talking to somebody, you know, and you were talking them through adding this sort of delivery function to their own business, um, a, 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 would there be like a top three things that you would say make sure to do this or to not do that? Yeah, I think it's really just learning the client, but also making sure that you're keeping your own costs where they need to be. I know we we lowered our prices from what they normally would be. So we're definitely getting less of a profit margin on that. But like I said, when we started out saying this is for eight to 10 servings, you know, we learned pretty quickly. So I would say make your serving sizes smaller, you know, four. And now we're doing four. Which again, I don't think it's worth it to do two. Nice. Um, so we've been doing four to six. So if, if you do four, we're doing a delivery charge. And then if you're doing six or more, we're waiving the delivery charge. So, you know, knowing your client and knowing what they need and want, um, definitely mixing up menu items. People are going to forget you or lose interest if they're seeing the same thing. I think just being engaged on social media is a great way to do that. Uh, making it special like this week is a short road bolognese with four cheese ravioli um next week actually i don't know if i can say what next week is but it's another exciting comfort food um yeah we're gonna do a really cool cinco de mayo special so again nice. make sure that you're also listening to your clients so if people are requesting certain foods do that too um the packaging thing is interesting so to make it look really nice, you have to spend a lot of money on packaging and we're not there yet. I think eventually if we're going in this direction for say holiday parties, or we talked about doing um, not full service holiday parties, but maybe sending one person and keeping the food really high end for a smaller holiday party, if that's right. going to be the new norm. And we sort of want to figure out a better way to present our food because the look of what we do is so crucial. And I think, we wanted to use what we had because we didn't want to add another cost. Um, and I don't think the value's there. I, I think people like the look, but if they knew they had to spend X number more dollars on just getting a pretty package, they probably wouldn't want to spend it. Um, so that's that's another weird thing that we're navigating, the packaging. <laughs> Yeah, it's and it's another one of those things where um, you know I one thing you and I didn't talk about was that um, I I had a like a in in my background which has been a long time in this industry there was a a, a portion of time where um, I was involved in catering um, right. so I was like a senior catering sales manager uh, first for one company and then for like a national company um, and the the second gig um, um, really it was with a company that. Um, made 70% of their year at Thanksgiving. Those wow. Thanksgiving those Thanksgiving packages were yeah. their money. That was their money maker. Um, and everything else we did in the rest of the year was just sort of like the gravy. It was like the bonus money. Um, <laughs> <Nobody did. laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, it, so it's one of those things where, uh, you know, as we go forward, um, I think that's going to be really interesting from a catering perspective. Like, yeah. you know, catering is so presentation heavy. It's not, you know, uh, like people would ask me, um, you know, both then and, and now, you know, within, you know, what I do now, um, oh, you know, like, why is a platter of cheese $75? Why is a platter of fruit $150? Why, you know, they ask you about these prices and everything. Right. Um, and I, what I always tell them is just wait until you see it. It's, a, it's about the time um, and creativity that someone's going to take to make that you know, yes, it's cheese, but now, you know, they're going to make it even cheese. It's right. cheese. And somebody um, else is doing it for you. <laughs> right. And someone else is doing it for you and they're carving it into pretty shapes. And right. and no, that's not easy. Go ahead and try it with your Velveeta. Right. Feel free. And yeah, pull out a block of Velveeta and a carving knife and get back to me. <laughs> quarantine activity. Yes, quarantine. I like that. We, we could, uh, you could do that with the kids out there for anybody who, uh, who wants to take up that as a hobby. Um, but, uh, you know, speaking of, of NACE, which is, uh, you know, for anybody who's not familiar, the, the National Association of Cater for Catering and Events, 
uh, a while back, we had as one of our guest speakers, um, someone who has a fruit carving business. And I'll show and I'll tell you how, um, you know, people talk a good game until they're presented um, with the actual possibility of getting up there and putting their money where their mouth is. So she was up there and she had like her full tool set and she had watermelons and melons and things. And she was walking us through how to make rosettes and different things. I mean, gorgeous things, yeah. spectacular things. And then she was like, hey, let's go ahead and get a couple of volunteers to come up and, and do it. And not, not a single person. We're like, I don't want to lose fingers. I don't want to look like a fool. Yeah. Um, because we know it's hard work. We know right. presentation um, is a thing. Um, you know, like when you go out and you, you know, when people talk about a steak dinner um, and they talk about going out to a steak dinner, yes, you're paying for the steak, but what you're paying for is for someone to masterfully cook it with all the oils and the butters that you're too afraid to put on that steak. Because <laughs> there's that. Um, yeah. and, then, and then you sit down to a beautiful white tablecloth and china that you, you know, probably, you know, wouldn't set out for your own purposes in your own home and what, and what have you. Um, so when you're talking about that presentation side, um, was that, was that a hard, I mean, your executive chef sounds like, a, like a great guy, like he was really on it. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, but in your kitchen, like your pantry, and your, your Sue and everybody was like back there, was it a hard thing for them? To be like, I'm not a line cook. I, you know, I'm not here to make sandwiches. I'm here to make filet. Um, or how did they? How did they handle that pivot for their own? Yeah. Culture? So there's. So while they were still there, I mean, there's kind of a sad answer to this is that we uh, had to lay off most of our kitchen staff. But while they were still there, they were just kind of grateful to be doing anything. I think. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I mean, we're used to doing extremely high end events and large events and 500 person galas with four course meals. Um, you know, so yeah, it was doing these little portions. I think it almost like raises the cost in a weird way because it's, you just can't buy as big, you know, you can't buy in bulk. You have to, you can't be doing all of this little work. It, there was just a lot more that they could get done when we were doing full, full fledged events. Um, yeah. Cause when yeah, you're already a hundred of the same thing, chef. it's different. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, it's just our chef and we have a couple people go, go in and try to help in the kitchen um, when we can just with like prep work. Um, but it's, it's, it's not what we do, but it's, right. it's what we do now. You know, again, we're, we're going in, we're not doing it halfway. We're, right. we're doing it all the way. We're putting our best into it. We're still doing that really good, high quality food. Uh, we're just doing it where we drop it off and give you reheating instructions. Yeah. Um, so again, it's just kind of something that's keeping us afloat right now, keeping cash flow, keeping people busy, keeping morale up, and just making sure people know that we're still here. Yeah, it's um, and and that's important because if if for no other reason. Um, than to just kind of keep, you know, be, like people are forgetful um, and, you know, and, and all that, you know, sort of, you know, uh, you know, all that legwork that people have been doing in terms of marketing. Um, I know that, you know, certainly on an event planner end, um, you know, p people, I know that there are planners out there who put a lot of dollars into marketing uh, and they put a lot of effort into their marketing. Um, and this is exactly that time period where all of that can fall off. You know, yeah. like it falls away and then like nobody remembers you in three or four yeah. months. Because that's the that's really the society that we're living in where, you know, we have very short attention spans. So we have to be ever present, right. um, you know, and, and uh, you know, when I was looking through Capers website, speaking of marketing, we'll kind of make a little, little bit of a shift. Um, the, the, one of the first images that popped up, so cute. I really wanted to give it a, like a little bit of shine was Penny. Is it oh, Penny? Yeah. It, like She's so, explain Penny to people because Penny is okay. adorable. So Penny Lane is a 1973 yeah. VW mobile bus that we bought on eBay. Um, shipped, awesome. her, shipped her to Boston uh, from the Midwest. She was hot orange and completely rotted out. Um, gave her a lot of love, a lot of baths fixed her up. She is beautiful now. She's gray. She has um, a 
oyster shell opening or clamshell opening off the side. So we've turned her into a mobile bar. Um, she's stunning. People love her. We can bring her to your event, whether you're working with us as a catering team or you just want bar service. And then she also works well as a food truck situation at some fun parties. So Penny Lane is, you know, she was supposed to go out a lot this April and this May and this June, and she might just be getting a longer rest, um, but we still have hopes for the fall. So. Yeah, well, it, you know, it, it's interesting because um, food trucks and mobile options have come up a lot lately. Um, so that was what was interesting to me is I'm like, oh, they already have something built in where, yeah. you know, if we are limited as an industry for gathering, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, how that affects us as, a, as an events industry, but that affects everyone yeah. um, because because we provide the service that other people gather you know, they gather two, gather four. Um, so, you know, it, it might affect us, but your company might be affected because they put on a picnic every year. That can't happen. All summer picnics canceled, all of them. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, all the 4th of July celebrations, um, you know, so while that affects us on, on this side of the, the planning and catering and production side of things, um, it certainly has these this ripple effect because now, of course, these events aren't happening for, for these companies anywhere. So finding these innovative ways to offer people um, options um, and variety, um, I think are, are gonna be really where it's at. Like, was this Penny Lane's first, like inaugural year or had she been yeah. on the road? Oh, 2019 okay. was her first year. We launched her in May of 2019 and she went out a lot last year. She went out a lot last summer. We did some cool photo shoots with her. Um, just a lot of interest. And it's, you know, again, it's it's sad that she won't be going out for a while, but we're staying positive, you know, we well, have to. You, you can, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that that's a really amazing way to look at it. It's like, stay positive. Um, she, she, she can become like your goodwill ambassador yeah, for capers. Right, right, just like it's send her out. Right. Uh, could do all sort of like fun and weird things with with that with that bus, um, yeah. but you know, but that was that was really uh, you know a lot of fun and um, you know capers. So you were you were saying that you know it's owned by uh, the the owner is a woman. How yeah. long has she had the company? Did you know uh, like what like yeah. was this uh, a long time venture for her? Or? Yep, she started the company must be 27 or 28 years ago now. She started it herself. She went to culinary school and loved parties and started doing parties and catering out of her station wagon. Um, eventually they moved to a small space and she hired, a, she started doing sales. So she hired a chef so that she wasn't doing both because she had found that she'd burn the food if she was trying to sell and all that. Sure. Uh, and then we moved to a bigger space and maybe 15 years ago. Um, and honestly, like we've, she's she's still there with us every day, um, you know, obviously now virtually, but she's put all of her love and, and effort. It's like her baby. Um, right. She's built an incredible business and it's great to work for a woman on business, just, you know, to, to see, you know, just to, to be supportive and to see how much she's done. She's sort of the innovator. So she always has these great ideas. Penny Lane was her idea. Oh, yeah. um, she's got a great eye, you know, she helped design the website. Um, and I've been there, actually this May will be 11 years. So. Wow, oh, that's amazing for, <laughs> it's amazing for really any company out there, but for, you know, in a sales position, um, yeah. that's, that's pretty amazing. Yep. Um, I think our, our general manager has been there maybe 20 years. Wow. Um, our chef has been there five or six. And then all of our staff, we have staff, event staff, event chefs who've been there 12, 15, 18 years. So it's kind of insane. Um, it is like a little family, you know, everyone sort of knows each other really well. And um, so that's something to be said about the way she's run the business. 
Yeah, it, it, and it's amazing when I, whenever you can look at a business um, that not only has people who have you know not only like longevity because I don't think that that's always necessarily the the main indicator um, of <laughs> right. a well run, you know I, like you know not not alone but people who have been in that in with the company for a long time that can also continuously say glowing things about the company that's the real key. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great thing to have like an employee who's been, been with you for 20 years, but that could be 20 years of like, yeah, <laughs> power, bitter, like, uh, you know, it, it was close to my home and now they've got me by, you know, now they've got me by the neck and I, I'm just waiting to retire. Um, right. so, right. so that's amazing. Um, yeah. you know, and, and then, and then you were, and, you know, and, and then you have like this whole other side, I mean, aside from like you know, your personal life and marriage and, you know, wanting like having, you know, all that fun stuff, you decided to get involved, you know, with an association. Yeah. Um, you know, we are a, vo a volunteer based association. So everyone does this for free. And uh, <laughs> you know, no, nobody's getting paid to do any of this work. I'm just gonna put that right out there. No, no, one, paid, no one, not one, uh, unless they work for NACE, right. no one paid for any of Correct. this. Um, you know, and, uh, and you've been doing that for quite some time. Um, and did you find that personally very, um, beneficial? Like, obviously you wouldn't continue to do it unless you found it personally beneficial, but like, like if you're giving your pitch to someone as to like, why join an association mace or something else, like yeah. why should people, especially now when money's tight and people are like, I don't know that how long I'm going to be in the events industry to begin with. Um, you know, I don't know if this is going to continue. Right. Um, you know, what, what would you say to people right now, um, about joining groups? Yeah, I think right now is the most crucial time. I think yeah. this is the time where you need resources and you need community and you need people to lean on and you need people to, that are like-minded and in the same situation as you to vent to, you know, like my husband doesn't want to hear it every day. He's in the construction world. I <laughs> You know, I have these people through NACE that are offering free webinars. These are national speakers who are offering their time and service to all members and even non-members just because, just because they want to be a resource and they want to help. Um, right. You know, there's this whole community feel around NACE that it's, it's local, it's national. I think it is, as any association, I would say it is what you make of it. I think yeah. you have to be present and have to be part of it in order to reap the benefits. But even from the level of, you know, some people aren't going back to their jobs after this. Some people right. don't have a job after this. So to be part of a community that, I mean, that's going to be your, your job bank. That's going to be your wealth of people to talk to about who's hiring, who's, you know, who's in need of this. You know, I think this is the time where you're going to even get stronger relationships with them. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree about. with you. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you um, because I, I feel like, um, you know, I see right now where there's like a lot of effort for people to, you know, join line, join online communities and community groups and like different sort of like mastermind groups and, you know, and other sort of like networking groups. Um, but I, but those are two excellent points and something that I point out all the time is like, groups are only as good as what, as the effort you put in, like output is input with a group. Um, so you can't join and then just expect to get that level of support, you know, immediately and for, no involvement on your part. So you have to participate, you have to engage. Um, and, and if you do that, the, your input is exponentially returned to you. So it's not like, you know, you're going to join and you're going to be like, Oh, you know, it's, it's kind of a wash. Like, you know, I put in an hour and I only get, but so much back, you get so much more back. Um, right. so, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent for that as well. Um, and, and really, um, you know, it, it, within your role within, you know, NACE as a particular association, you've been in contact with different, you know, um, chapters, my, my chapter, Washington, DC, as well as others. Um, like, are you finding that it's it, the same sentiments and, um, struggles are being resounded across the board? Or do you find like some, some areas have been more affected than, than other areas or, like, what are you finding between the different um, geographical areas in the U.S.? Yeah, so so 
just to kind of give a name to what Trish is speaking about, I'm a CLC mentor. So it's a chapter liaison um, mentor where I'm helping different chapters across the country through NACE. I have six different chapters that I check in with monthly just to kind of get a pulse on how they're doing, be a resource for them, be that intermediary between their local chapter and the national chapter. Um, and I am, I would say a lot of my chapters that I'm checking in with are along the East Coast and some go as far as the Midwest. Okay. My experience is that we're all in the same boat. Um, that might be different if you're talking to somebody that isn't in the event industry um, in, you know, a very rural area. But from my experience, everybody's being hit by this. If you still have your job, there's a chance your neighbor might not. If you, you know, I think people are feeling the same way. I think they're feeling really down and really sad about there not being events and just really worried about the industry as a whole. And then at the same time, it changes daily. Some of the same people will be very hopeful and join these webinars or these happy hours together and lean on each other and just say, listen, like today really was bad. And I feel like I'm not going to have a job. I'm not going to be able to afford any, you know, my, my bills. And then we'll kind of talk to each other. So then another day someone will say, events are going to come back, right? Like yeah. people need to be social. People are social creatures. They need right. to have fun parties to celebrate. So yeah, I think across the country, it's just everybody sort of in that same weird feeling of anxiety and then hope. And sometimes it's every hour they feel right. something different. But that's the beauty of kind of having a community so you can then and just see how other people are dealing with it. Yeah, I uh, and I I think that kind of grow goes across like, you know, even if you're not involved with the events industry and you're just kind of, um, you know, tuning into this from from a exterior perspective, um, even, you know, just something like, you know, a BNI. Um, or your chamber of commerce, or you know, just being involved in some sort of group on a on a local level, um, you know, is, is helpful. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, but you know, certainly keying into a group that has some sort of like national presence, so that you can talk to, you know, other cities and and get like ideas from other markets. I mean, that's the, um, you know, we we keep talking about you know, especially within this industry, you know, cooperation over competition. Um, I think that sometimes that's given um, a little bit of lip service because I, I you know, I, I think that sometimes people um, kind of get confused by what that really, really means. Um, and, you know, and, and then they'll, they'll kind of, you know, sort of follow that up with some sort of saying like, oh, there's business enough for everyone. And I'm like, really? Is, is there enough business for everyone? <laughs> <laughs> or you no, know, how, that, yeah, yeah, not not right now. Um, but but I, you know, for me personally, the way I interpret that um, is that, um, you, you know, I can give you all the knowledge. I can I can open my doors and let you behind let you look behind the curtains all I want to. It's always going to be up to you to want to take that information and apply it towards your own business. So there's no magic secret. Um, so I can be as guarded about that information as I want to be, um, or I can be as forthcoming with that information as I want to be. Um, you're going to get that info somehow, some way. Um, so, so it's up to you as to how you run your own individual business and how you navigate, you know, within your own business world. Um, right. You know, so what I'm, so what I was, you know, really hoping in terms of, um, you know, through through NACE is, you know, especially, you know, reaching out on a national level as I've gotten to know other people from other chapters, it's like, you know, how do, how do other people, you know, navigate their, their lives and their businesses? Um, because again, it's, it's about that, that cooperation. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to, to steal the business. I'm just here to, to learn lessons and any lessons you can, you know, provide me with. Right. Um, so, so that's, that's always kind of like my, my takeaway with people. Um, but, you know, it, like in terms of then the Boston, market did you did you did you all focus just i mean i assume that you know you, there was enough business within boston that you didn't really have to go too far into the woods um in terms of like your rate your service radius um but did you ever find that you like you'd, you'd go into like the rhode island um or you know the cape or you know or wherever else did that take you geographically very far 
Yeah, we've, um, I would say less. So because there are such really good caterers in Rhode Island, we would go yeah. there less unless it was one of our clients and they had a private home there. We would go down. We've gone to Mystic, Connecticut before. Yeah. We've gone to Bar Harbor. Pizza Meat Harbor. There, a pizza. Lousy pizza. Yeah. Not great pizza. <laughs> and I will fight anybody being from Connecticut on that pizza. It's not great pizza. So. <laughs> Well, you heard it here, yeah, folks. Yeah, you heard it here. <laughs> um, but I would say, and not to bash any other caterers, but there are some clientele from Boston um, that want to bring a Boston caterer up to their lake house in New Hampshire or okay. their summer home in Maine. So we've done a lot in New Hampshire. We've done a lot in Maine. And again, going up to Bar Harbor, like Wow. A six hour drive from Boston and we've brought our entire staff, all of our food, refrigerated trucks, like set up shop and executed. Um, yes, we've gone to the Cape many times. The Cape is also a great spot. Um, so yeah, we've gone all around New England. We've gone to the Berkshires and done weddings. Love uh, it. Again, our bread and butter is sort of like a big circle around Boston. Right. But we'll right. go anywhere. Exactly. Come to DC well, if you want. <laughs> right, right. Like, well, you know, and certainly, like, I've seen, I've seen New York caterers come down to to yeah. DC. You know, depending on the client, but I, I haven't seen anyone from Boston just yet. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, in happier times, um, you know, I know that you all probably, like many other catering companies, um, had sort of themed menus depending on the season, depending on you know the the event. Like, what was your favorite yeah. menu? What what is your favorite? Well, we won't go. We won't go into the wases. We'll go into the ises. What, what is your favorite menu from your company? So many options. Um, I, I mean, just being from Boston, we do seafood. We do seafood really well. Our, our chef has lots of training in catering in restaurants. He was classically um, French trained, but he has this amazing Asian flair um, from his in-laws that taught him how to cook. And then he worked for a Jewish caterer for a long time. So he knows mm. how to do a lot of different foods. Um, and he's from Martha's Vineyard originally. So I think our fish dishes are awesome. I think our lobster dishes, you know, it depends what we're talking about. So I would say if it was like a six course plated wedding meal, there would have to be some sort of scallops on there over risotto. There would have to be like a, you know, a surf and turf with some nice lobster tail. Um, popovers, right? Like our popovers yeah. are so good. Um, and then if it was like a fun food station type of party, we do a really cool clam shack station. So fried oh. clams, mini lobster rolls, clam chowder. I mean, it's cliche, but I, I grew up in Boston. I love the seafood here. I love that sort of, you know, when people travel here and have events from outside the area, I love showing them that cool representation of Boston and New England food. Um, I don't know. I like everything we make. It's bad. Like, I'm glad I'm not eating there every day right now because we used Can to. You imagine? It's, I mean... Our, we, we do a lot of things really well. Yeah, I, you're well, you had me at seafood station. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's that's a really hard thing. I don't know. I don't think that a lot of people appreciate um, how difficult it is from a catering perspective. Right, um, it's picky. Fish is a, it's like picky enough when you're cooking it in your own kitchen and you're transferring it directly to your plate. It's, you know, doing that for, you know, any sort of like, yeah. You're doing that for 500 people is going to, you know, is really, um, that's a that's a feat in and of itself. So kudos to your chef. Yeah, um, knowledge is power. Experience is power. I mean, once yeah. you've been doing it as long as we have, you you learn by your mistakes. Like you yeah. learn how to do things really well because you've probably failed a few times. So you know, we do fillets and we do steak entrees really well. You know, yeah. nothing that's like overcooked and you can't go table by table and take the temperature order, but we aim for a nice medium to medium rare. And it's, it's, I'm not a chef personally, so it, it is still amazing to me how our, our team does it and does it so well. Yeah. It's, it's always great to, to work with um, someone that's just amazingly talented um, because it makes you look like a rock star, right? Cause you're out there selling the product um, yeah. and there's nothing worse than selling a product that's faulty. 
I wouldn't be able to do it personally. I'm a terrible liar and I would not be able to sell something that I didn't believe in or love. So luckily I get to just talk about food all day. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and sometimes it's like, it's not always like the glamorous life. Like sometimes you get like these super, no, yeah. You know, sometimes you get like these super picky, um, I, well, and I shouldn't say super picky, but sometimes people have like a lot of dietary restrictions. Like I, uh, just did, I did an event in February and it was with someone who, um, I mean, talk about dietary restrictions. She came with a writer. She yeah. had like three, like a full page. And it was two main paragraphs about what she could eat, and what she can't eat. And then like the following paragraph was like a bullet point of everything that she could eat. So like, you know, all of that to settle in on like white rice and broccoli. That's what she could eat. I, the poor thing, you know, like she must have to do that every event or every restaurant she goes to. When, yeah, when it, like that comes up, we usually just ask like, what would you like to eat for dinner? And we'll make it for you because... Yeah. Thank Rather you. than try to go through a menu that's already created and, and separate it out, it just creates, you know, risk for contamination. So we usually just do a completely separate meal and, you know, keep it separate the whole time. I mean, allergies are real and people yeah. have more dietary restrictions now than ever. Yeah. And I think that, I think that's one of those things where, um, you know, like years ago I, I worked with somebody who was dismissive of allergies. Um, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and I think that that's like the, that's, that's really a bad perspective to take that I'll just call it for what, like I see it, that's a bad thing to call yeah. anyone's allergies fake or to be dismissive of them. Um, right. you know, but, but certainly, you know, want, you know, that it allows, I think catering companies to be creative um, in terms of their menu offerings, because it's like, okay, well now um, it's kind of, it's kind of like, I call it like the iron chef of situations where <laughs> yeah. it's kind of like, like you go to like, he doesn't know and he's going to go to the table and it's going to be like these to 10 ingredients. And now you've got to make a dish out of that. Um, and it's going to be del delicious enough to like pass muster um, right. on a professional stage. And you have to cook it in like 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because someone out, someone out on the, uh, the reception floor didn't tell us about his seafood allergies and the whole, you've got a seafood station. You've got clams, clam juice all over everything. Um, you know, so what are you going to do? Um, what, what has been, um, what, what has been the most challenging menu you've had, ever had to produce? Do you think I might be asking you to like dig deep into the archives with that one? Yeah. I don't think, so I don't think any of our allergen menus have been challenging. I think there's two things that come to mind and they weren't really challenging. It was challenging more on a service level. So one, I had a bride who was vegan and so was the groom. Great. Fine. We did a beautiful vegan menu for them. Honestly, our, our chef is so good that I don't even think most of the guests would have noticed or been upset that there wasn't meat. The father of the bride was so against this that he had just threatened to bring a hot dog cart to his daughter's wedding, this, that, and the other thing. So I think that was really challenging to try to make dad who was paying realize that like, it was just such this like tension. And I don't think he actually brought a hot dog cart to the event. Um, but you know, a vegan menu is challenging because other people may have such strong opinions about it and right. think that it's not going to be a nice meal or a nice wedding when in reality it is. Um, the other one we've done, and again, it was challenging, but we did it. We had a groom who was uh, from Morocco. Okay. He wanted a Moroccan menu. Okay. Great. Cool. Awesome. Um, our chef is very resourceful, is very good in a lot of cuisines. I don't know if Moroccan was one of his top five or even top 10, right? But the conversation was had, came in for his tasting. He had sent us some recipes from his mother. We worked on them. He said, okay, this is actually really good. This one, not so good. Okay adorable mother came to our kitchen for like five hours one day and sat there and made this amazing Moroccan special dish with our chef. So the chef could see, I mean, she had sent like documents outlining it, but she actually came in and our chef was open to it. 
which is awesome for Jeff. Yeah, that's really great. And, that's amazing. Yeah. And she did it all in front of him so that when the wedding came around three months later, it was just such that more personal. And no, was it perfect? Probably not. I mean, who can compete with your mom's famous Moroccan dish? But it right. was pretty damn close. And they were so happy. And I think that it was just something that worked really well for when she made it for her family. But when you do 130 people, it may not translate into the catering world properly. So our chef had worked really closely and I'm sure it was challenging. But I ended up making it catering friendly, tasty, and just to show that effort to a client, I think goes a, a long way. So I would say those two are kind of like challenging. Or like challenging. The, the top ones. Like, yeah, like the, yeah, I could probably go on and on, but those are the two off the top of my head. Yeah, but that's that, that's that's a lot of fun. Like I, you know, I've always been someone um, where um, I'm not. Um, I don't like working with clients that are very cookie cutter. Um, yeah. And I and I shouldn't. Well, and I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say that on live. Um, but <laughs> <I don't mean. laughs> that's okay. We're quarantined. Who cares? So, yeah. I mean, what day is it? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, no. But but in but in all actuality, um, I like clients that give me a bit of a challenge, like whether it's a design challenge or you know a cuisine challenge or what, yeah. what have you, um, because it allows me to stretch that creativity um, mm -hmm. and to really um, kind of get into you know the the deep dive of yeah. um, you know, what their psychology is and why they wanted things you know, to happen a certain way or be designed a certain way. Um, right. so, so I personally love it. Yeah, I, I, I love the fact that, that you've had this, like probably this, you know, this woman came in and she was like this big, this big kitchen. And um, I love that your chef was open to it because that's not, Normal. that's a rare thing. That to find a really chef. good sport. Like yeah. it, yeah, he was a really good sport about it. <laughs> um, and, I'm, and I'm sure that everyone just like was super surprised. Um, yeah. with all that and I did sell stuff. Moroccan food for the rest of my career, right? Like I'm like, oh yeah, our chef knows how to make that. Like, what do you, sure. what else do you want? You know? So it added to our repertoire of what we could sell and what we could do, and it just created, you know, some camaraderie with a future sale or with a future client who may have those roots. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's all, it, it all snowballs like one, you know, yeah. one really great client experience, um, you know, snowballs into, into the next, um, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, that, and that kind of goes into the whole customer service aspect. Cause we've been talking, you know, obviously a lot, a lot about menu and even, you know, um, you know, catering in general. Um, but from a customer service perspective, um, you know, how have you been finding, um, how have your clients been, you know, have they been re responding in disbelief? Have they all been pretty much like easygoing and working with you? Um, or were there any sort of significant, um, you know, challenges to the way, you know, you handled it from a, from a service perspective? Um, yeah, not even I, talking about food. Yeah, I think so. The number one, the, I would say food and service are the top two things we hear the most positive feedback about um, as our company. And I think if they, it, it's very reasonable to be upset right now, right? Like if you're right. abroad and you're, you've been waiting for this day, you've put in a lot of money, you've put in a lot of time, and all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> my wedding is not happening in May anymore. Um, you know, that's not to say that there haven't been tears, but I have not, I've been more of a, this is kind of like a, a what are the options phone call rather than break down and really lose it. And again, I think those probably happen. I think right. there's a lot of breaking down and losing it for everyone right now. Um, but with our clients, we've been really fortunate that there was one, I'm trying to think, I think all of them have postponed Good. all of our weddings for April, May, June have postponed to either 2021 or this fall. Right. One was considering canceling, but then they ended up booking for 2021. Um, so I think there, you know, it's kind of what we do as planners and caterers every day is sort of problem solve, right? 
come up with plan B, come up with plan C. Even if the client doesn't know there's a plan B or C, there is. And especially when we're in New England, it's like it could rain any hour of the day or it could be sweltering. Um, so we always have like multiple plans in place that maybe we don't even communicate with the couple and they just trust us to make the right decisions. So I think, you know, a lot of these calls have been, okay, what's plan B going to be? Right now your wedding's in July. This is the most current conversation I'm having. Your wedding's in July. We've signed, you know, you've signed a contract, you sent a deposit. If the governor comes out next week and says, this is extended through the end of July, what are our plans? Let's look at these dates. Do you want to move it out a month? Do you want to move it out three months? Do you want to move it to 2021? Let's put you in those dates so that we have a backup plan. Let's reach out to all of your vendors. Find out their availability. We're going to move your deposit there. The way we've been doing our contracts is we've been loosening the cancellation clauses um, just because it's the right thing to do. Um, if we're going to make the money, you know, we already know 2020 is going to sort of be pretty bad, but I'd rather make the money than have them cancel full out. So we're moving deposits right. to the next year, um, for, for weddings. Um, so a lot of it has just been, do you have this date available? Yes or no? Do you think we should move it? That's a harder question because what well, I don't know. Right. right. It's so unknown right now. Um, if I were like, I could say what I would do personally, but it's not going to apply to every single person out there. Um, yeah. So I think it's just having a conversation and being like, we are here no matter what. We're, we're not going to go out of business. We are not, you know, going to take all your money whatever we can do to make it as seamless as possible for your transition and your peace of mind, we're going to do. And then if, if it's helpful for me to call your tent vendor or call your band or, you know, I'm happy to do that too. Yeah. And how do you, how, you know, one of the underlying fears that I've um, had from several clients at this point is, you know, how do we even know that that vendor is going to be in business um, going forward? Um, you know, and, it, you know, the way that I've personally responded to that is, you know, you know, A, you don't, because, you know, you never really know financially how, you know, a company is doing until something like this, you know, hits or like, and that could really happen at any point in time. Like, there's right. really no guarantee um, that any business is as financially stable um, as they let on to be. Um, and I said, but, you know, the, the second part of that is maintaining that communication with that company. Um, and, and asking the right questions. So, you know, and, and they're certainly not going to ask you those questions. So, right. you know, so if, so if you were coaching someone, you know, who was right now is kind of thinking like, yeah, you know, that's all really well and good. And we we're talking about the fun things that you're doing and everything like blah, 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 blah. But how do we really know that any company is going to stay afloat? Um, you know, like, like how would you allay that, those fears for them? Yeah, I think in, in terms of if they were asking about Capers in particular or if someone was just asking about any of their vendors. Any of their vendors. I think having, you know, asking those questions can't hurt. I, I think it could be, it has the potential of being awkward, but right. you're their client, right? So they, right. they have somewhat of an obligation to be clearly communicating with you. Maybe you talk about the deposits or the deposit schedule. Maybe you see if you can reduce your deposit or get any of your deposits back. I mean, people will hate me for saying that, but it, I think it's just to create trust with any client in doing a sale, you have to have this like real conversation. And yeah. by real, I don't mean freaking them out and causing panic, but I think saying like, from my perspective, I know we're going to be here in 2021 and you just have to trust that I'm saying that because that's how I feel. Um, the other thing you can do is sort of have backup plans. Like I'm a big backup plan person and maybe it's because I'm an anxious human and I just like to have different options all the time, but look at other vendors and just have someone in mind 
even reach out and ask their availability if you want. You know, it can't hurt just to have someone on your radar. That's sort of what I would do. I would sort of just have people in the queue. Is that the word? In the queue, ready to kind of go if yeah. I need to on them. And I think that's a pretty solid plan. I mean, especially as we go forward and, um, you know, and, and certainly there, are, you know, and not, not necessarily, I don't think that people would necessarily get too worried about sort of the larger companies <clears throat> out there, but, you know, but there are certainly, um, you know, there are photographers and bakers and, you know, independents um, yeah, who sure. are out there that, you know, that, you know, it, that's going to be, you know, a hard, a hard thing to plan for, plan for, but, um, but certainly having that plan in action um, can't hurt. It can't right. hurt. You know, it, it's a lot of had, unnecessary work, but. We already had a request for, from a bride that told us her caterer went out of business already. Um, and she's supposed to get married this August. So could we help? And she's up in Maine. Um, so, you know, again, we did a quick proposal for her and she's, she's feeling like it's very much like doomsday and she needs to figure it out. Like she's in panic mode, but right. we sort of said, you know, you're good. Like August is good. We have time. We also all don't know what's going to be going on then. So let's, you know, if you do want to book with us, we're going to send you this COVID-19 contract we put together that has these looser cancellation policies and a complete move your deposit to a postponed date. Um, I, I do think, unfortunately, we're going to see that. And it yeah. is something to think about. And I think you just have to wait, but also have a mild, have like a little backup plan. Yeah. Do. Yeah, exactly. That, I mean, that's, that's all you can do is have, the, you know, the plan for the plan. Right. Right. You know, the, the, the plans have plans. That's, that's how you know. <laughs> yeah. That's how you know you're working always. in the event industry. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, plans have plans. Your plans have plans. <laughs> right. And that's why you hire us because we will have five different plans that you, again right. you, you may not even know about. We're going right. to make sure this goes off without a hitch. And the beauty <laughs> of it is that every, every one of your vendors is going to have five different plans. Yeah. So you've got five vendors. That's twenty five plans right there. So, yeah. and if it does have a hitch, you are not going to know about it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Hopefully. Um, yeah. Good, good lord. Um, yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, to, to end on a, on a lighter note, thank you so much. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're almost at that one hour mark. So I wanted to be respectful of your time and uh, for the people watching. Um, the way that I like to, to wrap this, uh, you know, these interviews is to ask my final question. Um, so that that is everything opens up and you can do whatever you want to do. Where are you eating and what are you eating? Wow. Going back to the taco game, my yeah. favorite taco spot, it was on Eater 38 in Boston. It's called Yellow Door Taqueria. It's in my neighborhood. So it's like support small businesses. Right. Uh, I'm going there and I'm going to sit at the bar and I'm going to get everything on the menu and I'm going to have all the margaritas and just just all of them to the music and I'm going to talk to everybody that's there and <laughs> I'm going to it's just going to be amazing. It's super simple, but it's kind of just going to feel like a normal night again for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think we're, I think we're all there. Um, tacos think, all yeah. Ta tacos make it happen. They make know? the most amazing tacos. Like if you're ever in Boston, you have yeah. to come. Okay. So you said it was yellow door. Yellow door. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Make that note people yellow door. Tacos. <laughs> All right, Kristen, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, and I hope that, you know, the people out there, you know, found a little bit of inspiration. Um, and certainly, you know, if you need a caterer in Boston, you know who to contact. Call me. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much, Trish. It's good to kind of, you know, talk and share our stories and share our thoughts. And I really do strongly believe that people need each other. They need social events. They need celebrations. So I know the event industry is going to come back. And it's just a matter of when. So hang in there and stay positive and exactly. stay safe and stay, stay healthy. Yep, exactly. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And on that note, we will we'll wrap it up for today. Have a great day. Okay.